So if you're a department with a university, you have a budget, um, typically larger departments, and you can fund to have some custom development done, we can also do that for you. But a lot of our work, which I'll talk about, is um, our Drupal templated distribution, which is uh, basically a do-it-yourself solution for creating like a department or center website where you don't have to pay anything for it. Um, we host it for you and we give training classes on how to use it. So um, these are our website services. They're kind of put into like three different bubbles based on what kind of website you have. Uh, department programs and centers, um, faculty, researcher, and lab sites, and student group event sites and like topical websites. And the technologies that power them. So department centers, um, program sites, this is like our bread and butter where we focus most of our attention on. Um, these are like the big departments of the university. You'll probably have a website that's on this platform. Um, so Drupal template is what we call this big multi-site Drupal distribution. Um, Drupal custom is if you don't fit into like what we offer with this template distribution, we'll create a completely custom Drupal 7 uh, site for you. And then Roxin is an old content management system that we're at the tail end of a big migration project to move everyone off of it. Um, so there's only about, oh, uh, well, I'll get into that. But for the faculty researcher and lab sites, we're using Open Scholar. Uh, Open Scholar is, just happens to be another distribution that's built on Drupal, but we don't um, develop on it. It was originally developed by Harvard University, and um, the organization within Harvard that has developed it has since split off into like a separate LLC. So you can go to like theopenscholar.com, I think, and like use their platform to host a website too. But we generally put like individual faculty and individual grad, um, grad student websites on that. Um, it's a little cheaper from a technical standpoint to spin one up. Um, all the sites are within like one big monolithic database, uh, Drupal database. Um, and uh, but the you know the user experience is a little easier to use than the traditional Drupal stuff that we have for our department websites, and it's also geared more towards the faculty. So there's a lot of stuff in there for publications, um, for student groups, event sites, and topical websites. We're uh, hosting those on WordPress multi-site. Um, all of this stuff is in the cloud. None of it's hosted, except for rocks, and but we only have about 25 rocks and sites left. Everything else is hosted in the cloud. So. The Drupal stuff is all on Acquia, including Open Scholar, and the WordPress stuff is on Pantheon. It didn't used to be like that. We used to have it all on-prem, but we've moved it all to the cloud, which has been good because we don't have to focus on maintaining the infrastructure anymore. We maintain um, just basically the code and the distribution itself. So this, these are the rough numbers here uh, for a Drupal template. Um, there's 280 sites that are provisioned onto it, but about 50 of those are still maintenance mode, meaning that like we provisioned it and they're still developing the site. Um, for Drupal Custom, these are entirely custom Drupal 7 sites. Um, there's about 40 of those. Um, Roxon, there's about 25 left. Open Scholar and WordPress, they each have around 400 sites. So there's a lot of sites at Princeton, okay? Um, most of these have their own domain names too, like something.princeton.edu, um, except for the Open Scholar sites. <coughs> those are mostly like scholar.princeton.edu slash, usually like your name. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about the sites database. So this is um, a custom Symfony application that we maintain within WDS to help us track and, um, well, it's a utility application that's used for like provisioning, inventorying all of our sites, um, and it's doing a little bit more, which I'll get into. So it's a Symfony application. It didn't always used to be, but about two or three years ago we migrated it um, to this platform. And when you log in, you're initially met with just a giant list of all of our websites. <clears throat> so this primary use is really tracking the metadata for each site that we have. And we've got this like site search up here. So I can like put in the name of a site and find like quick results on the information. This is like the type of information we're storing for each site in our, our platforms. So you know we've got the platform that it's on. This is a Drupal 7 template site its name, um, the URL for the site, so you know we can go and check out the website, um, what department it's in, when it was requested, and the admin and tech contacts and the domains associated with it. So you know, I can go in and edit these details, and this is like when we're adding a new site, we'll go in here first and fill out all this information. And the sites database is also responsible for provisioning new sites um, to our cloud environment in Acquia. Um, so I'm talking strictly here about the Drupal 7 template platform. So we have this operations button here, and this is basically used, if I were to create a new site, there'd be a button here to provision the site. Right now it says reprovision because it's already up there, but you have this like provision option and it tells you what it's gonna do. 
uses Acquia's Cloud API to create the domains in Acquia that you've entered that you've entered, uh, create the database in Acquia, and um, it installs the site using Drush. So it's like a Drush command that'll run, it installs a site that takes about like seven minutes actually per site. It all happens in the background in a task manager, and you know, it does a few other things. Because this is a multi-site platform, and for those that aren't familiar with how Drupal multi-site works, all of the sites on the platform share the exact same code, but they all have their own separate databases. Um, and in Drupal multi-site, each site gets its own folder in the code base with its own settings.php file. And that file is what stores the credentials for the database that's associated with that site. And then there's another file, sites.php, which maps domain names to those specific site folders. So that when a request comes in for a site, Drupal's looking at that file, it knows what domain was requested, and it looks at that mapping to figure out which database to load to return that site. So the site's database is managing all of this for us. Um, it's doing all this behind the scenes when we provision a site. Is, is there any site factory or is that? Uh, we're, not, we're not using Acquia Cloud Site Factory now. So um, I can get into that a little bit later, but right now this is just traditional multi-site and um, there are challenges with it that would eventually drive us to do something like Aqua Cloud Site Factory because they've solved some problems that we have. Um, so beyond just tracking this metadata, we're also using this to store our offsite backups for all of the, uh, the database and files. So I go to this backups tab and we have a list of the files and this is like user uploaded content like images, PDFs, that sort of thing, and the databases too. So Aquia auto automatically creates three days worth of backups for us in the database, but they don't store them offsite or anything for us. So like what happens if Aquia goes away? That's very unlikely to happen, but if it does happen, we don't want to lose 280 websites overnight. So all these um, database are, databases are backed up um, and the files are backed up every night. And then we have like kind of a like decaying schedule for how long we'll keep the backups beyond that. But for most sites, we'll have a backup that goes back all the way like two years. So if you did lose content like that was that old, like there is a way for us to recover it. Um, there's console commands, Symfony custom console commands that we can use to actually restore a site um, from backup. It's not built into the UI, but if we needed to restore a site from backup, there's a command line that we could run and just give it the site ID and what backup file to restore. So we're also tracking a lot of statistics for all of our sites. Um, this is works via a custom uh, Drush command that I wrote that basically every night the sites database has a scheduled task that will go in and run this command on all of our sites and it just collects this basic information about the site. So we've got like the active theme on the site, if it's in maintenance mode or not. The last time an admin or a non-admin logged in, and admins mean anyone within WDS. So we don't care when WDS logged into it. We care when the actual users who are managing the site, when they logged into it. So this helps us figure out when a site has become stale, right? If someone is not logging into it, maybe the site's no longer being used and we can help figure out like which sites we can actually deprovision. Uh, active users, same thing, number of users, total nodes, and it's broken down by content type um, and taxonomy terms as well. And then we've got all the enabled modules on the site and their versions. So we're using this, if we go back to the home page and we could do uh, advanced search. So I can build up a little report here to see what sites are not in maintenance mode, which means they're live. Um, the theme is Tiger. And I wanna see sites that have over 50 events on them. Um, so this could be used by like project management or designers on our staff. If we know that we just launched a new site that's using this specific theme um, and we want to showcase it to another potential customer that wants to go on the platform, we can demonstrate to this, uh, demonstrate it by using this report building. So you know the list gives you the basic information, then you can click and log directly in or just visit the site. I think this is our dining site. So. Um, WDS is the primary user for this application, but our support and operations center also uses this. If they get a support ticket, like a site is down, um, they'll come to this uh, application and like paste in the URL of the site just to see if it's a site that WDS actually maintains to help figure out who's the owner of the site. 
All right, so I had a bunch of screenshots in here if I couldn't do the live demo, but since that worked out well, no need for that. Another feature here is um, basically the ability to sync environments. So <clears throat> if I go back to accessibility, let's see, one of the actions I could do here is sync environment. And so I can sync the database and files from the production environment in Acquia down to the QA and dev environment. So we get a lot of requests for um, users that you know, they want to work in their QA environment, they want to demo something or test out a new feature that we're about to deploy, but the content is stale because production has been receiving all these content updates. The, the QA version of their website doesn't automatically receive those content updates, so we sync the environment down for them. So Acquia's UI allows you to sync individual databases down, but it doesn't allow you to do the files directory for each site, so that's why we have this feature. All right. So that's the sites database. Um, you know, it's built on Symfony 3.4 um, using the Acquia Cloud API. It's using a PHP application called Deployer for deploying updates. This application is on-prem in Princeton's network. It's not hosted in the cloud or anything. Um, so it's using this Deployer application, which is similar to like Capistrano, if anyone's familiar with that tool. Um, but it's just to get the code up to the server. Uh, it's hosted on Princeton VM. It's got New, new in the past six months, this background task manager so that we're installing sites that happens in the background and you're not like waiting 10 minutes for the browser to load to like finish doing the task. Um, in the future, there's a lot that I imagine us doing with this platform to make it better. Um, right now, uh, provisioning new WordPress sites is still a pretty manual process that we have to go through. Um, so if we can get that done automated programmatically through the sites database, that'd be a big win for us too. Um, you saw how many WordPress sites we have. We get a lot of requests for them. So that's not like a uh, self-service platform. Open Scholar happens to be. So um, anyone with a Princeton Net ID can go to the open, openscholar.princeton.edu and like create a new site. And we don't have to be involved in that process. But for like WordPress sites and our Drupal Temple platform, we are involved in that. We have to provision the site for you. Um, automated and improved handling of contact information is big. So like I showed you, we, we track like tech contacts and admin contacts for our users um, or for our sites, but that information quickly becomes out of date. You know, like sometimes the tech contact will be like um, a SCAD um, for the department. It's just like a, a tech representative within that department, but they may change roles over time and that's no longer the person that's responsible for the site anymore. But we may never find out about that. Um, or if we do, like how do we make sure that our contact lists are kept up to date and that sort of thing. So ideally right now we have a separate like list serve that's used for you know adding users to to you know so we can send out email blasts to them, but it's not tied to the site's database. So in the future we'd like to uh, create better coupling there. Ability to duplicate sites would be a big one. Um, this is mostly for other department websites. If a site's been live for like two or three years and we want to do like a refresh of it, like a new theme or something, um, really what would be ideal is if we could duplicate the site they have put it under a different domain like accessibility-new.princeton.edu and then they can put that site maintenance mode and do all the work on it. So that act of duplicating it is a manual process right now. It takes like 15 minutes. That's actually another thing that Awkward Cloud Site Factory just gives you free. So it'd be a nice thing that we could build in. Um, so basically you have to go in and manually copy the database or provision a new database, copy the old database into it, copy the file directory over, make sure you don't screw anything up because you're working on production data. Um, so that's where we're thinking with the future of the application. So the Drupal 7 Temple platform is a big one that we maintain. Um, it's a pretty mature platform at this point. And um, it's hosted on Aquia, like I said. Uh, it's locked down, meaning that all sites pretty much have the same capability. There's no customization that we're developing on a per site basis. So they've all got the capability to add like news events, uh, people, course information, that sort of thing. Um, and you know the benefit of us doing that is it's a little more maintainable for us because we don't have to worry about when we're deploying updates, well, are we worried that some site that we develop custom functionality for is now gonna break? Like, is the developer that developed that functionality even aware how this new change might impact that? So all of the sites basically are pretty locked down. And they're like really locked down. Like you can't create custom taxonomy vocabularies or, um, it's basically, 
you know, we give you the site, you have a few themes to choose from. We do give you CSS injector to be able to, you know, customize the appearance a bit if you're familiar with CSS or you can hi um, hire us to do the CSS customizations for you. Um, but beyond that, it's pretty locked down. We have a monthly release cycle and I'll get into that. This, when I was working on this presentation, I thought it'd be interesting to try to figure out like how many sites we provision over time, thinking that the graph would look a lot more interesting, but it doesn't. It's actually pretty linear. So we started the platform in like the summer of 2014, and over time we've pretty steadily added. It has like ramped up a little bit recently, but we're at like 280 provision sites now. Um, so I'm gonna talk about our release planning and development of the platform. Um, so our, from the project management side, um, and development side here, we're using Bitbucket as the code repository for the development repository. Um, and we're also using Bitbucket for the issue tracking for um, figuring out like what issues need to be added during our project planning meetings. Um, so we have a pretty standard issue template that we have. I think it was loosely based off of what Drupal.org does when you're adding issues um, for Drupal core. But basically we, we gather this basic information to make it easier to figure out like um, you know, the changes that we're going to introduce with this issue, like how, who do they affect, who's requesting it, so we can figure out who we need to notify when the issue is completed, that sort of thing. Um, for scheduling, we're doing monthly releases now. This is something we settled into, I think, in the past like year and a half, but when the <coughs> platform was less mature, we were kind of still figuring out when to do releases, and we wouldn't have like a strict monthly release cycle. We would just kind of release stuff when we felt we had enough stuff to release. But now it's like much more um, standardized, and it's based around, we have these uh, monthly meetings on campus with the campus community called Website Wednesdays. And that's where we go. The first thing we do at Website Wednesdays is basically talk about the new features of the platform that we just deployed days before that. So we have these monthly release planning meetings where project managers and developer designer will be there. And a lot of what is discussed is you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, we're at the tail end of this big migration project to get all these sites off of rocks in this old content management system into Drupal. But some of those sites that are on rocks in has special functionality that is not available on the Drupal platform. So those are considered what like migration blockers, and those usually take the highest priority because we want to we don't want to stop progress of moving sites off of rocks in. <laughs> So priorities given mostly to that, those issues and most recently accessibility issues. Um, we have about three weeks of de development time per release and like one week of like QA testing time. The customers can be involved in the QA time too, which I'll get into. Um, for our development environment, it's nothing too fancy. Uh, we're using Acquia Dev Desktop, which is not fun to talk about. Like no one's gonna be giving a talk on how cool Acquia Dev Desktop is. Um, but in, in fact, I wish Aquia would spend a little more time like maintaining it and making it like better because you know with all of like the talk around like using stuff like Docker and Drupal VM, it still like introduces complexity to your local environment that becomes a total like pain in the butt when something goes wrong because you don't want to spend a lot of time diagnosing and debugging your tooling, especially when you don't have when you have a lot of people using it. So when you have a lot of designers and developers on the platform that aren't intimately familiar with like the local development environment, something goes wrong. Now you've got like one person that can help solve that problem for that person. And so dev desktop is like stupid simple to set up and it's very fast. There's really no abstraction layer. It installs Apache and PHP and MySQL directly on your, your system. So there's obviously downsides to doing that, but um, it's fast and it, it, it's worked out pretty well for us. We're using a Drush make file for storing like the actual um, li like libraries and dependencies that we depend on. So our, our Bitbucket de development repository does not actually have any of like the Drupal core or Drupal contrib module code in it. We just store the stuff that we own, like our custom modules, our custom themes, and that's it. And we're using a Drush make file, which is just a big list of contributed modules and the versions, like the metadata about your dependencies. Like in modern Drupal world, this is what Composer does for you. But yeah, before Composer, this is what everyone did for dependency management in Drupal. Um, we're using a task runner called uh, Grunt. Um, Gulp is another one that's very similar to it, just a Node.js based task runner. And um, Pantheon, no, not Pantheon, Phase 2 had developed integration with it to make local development of Drupal easier. 
So it basically um, has a bunch of tasks that are set up to help organize your project directory so that um, you run a simple command and it creates like a build artifact. Meaning the build artifact is all of your custom code and all of your dependencies in like one complete Docker site that you would actually deploy up to the server. Um, and everyone in our department is pretty much using a Max, which makes uh, things pretty easy. We do have one developer that's on a Linux machine, but he doesn't work on this platform. And we have, uh, I think, a project manager or two using Windows, but they're not doing local development. <coughs> okay, so the code workflow for this. We have one main branch called develop that all the development is branched off of. So anytime we have a new issue that's being developed on, uh, we create a feature branch off of that branch. And the branch name has the issue number in it. That's very important. And the brief description of the issue. Nothing too fancy there. Um, we do force a specific commit message for all the commits. So you have to have like issue number, the Bitbucket issue number, colon, and then like a short sentence. Um, the idea there obviously is like, you know, if we're going back in time like two or three years um, to see why something was done, if the commit message isn't super clear, at least we have the issue number, we can go to Bitbucket, figure out the full conversation there. Um, we're doing pull requests for code review and uh, creating a Probo environment. Um, Probo is a company that was um, created by ZivTech, what I think they're here. Um, this has been really useful for us. Basically what happens is every time a pull request is created, it spins up this Probo um, build. And Probo, just you give it a list of tasks to run, it checks out your code, and at the end of it, it basically installs a fresh Drupal site with your, the code in the pull request and gives you a link to view the site. So when we're working on like a new feature or a bug fix, it spins up a Probo site for us, and anyone who's QAing that work has a fresh Drupal site to go to make sure that everything works as it should. <coughs> Testing of features, I just talked about this a bit. Um, so occasionally we will deploy this up to the development environment in Acquia, um, which I think I'll get into in a second. This is what Probo looks like. Um, pretty simple, it works with Docker, so you, it basically spins up a Docker container with an image that you tell it to use and it executes these steps. Like one of the steps on the bottom here is install Drupal. So we're giving it a bunch of dependencies it has to install, it installs Drupal. A few more steps you don't see here are like um, create default content and install and create some default users. So we have like five different standard user roles like site administrator, content manager, that sort of thing. To make QA process faster, we're pre-creating user accounts on the Probo environment, just using the same username and password as the name of the role. So I can quickly log in as content manager username, content manager password, and log into that Probo site as, as a content manager. Um, okay, so step one, so like the whole deployment workflow, it's deploying to the Acquia development environment. Um, so we're using Bitbucket pipelines for this, which is very similar to like a Jenkins or a Travis CI, something like that, just a CI integration. And uh, what it's going to do is it's going to check out the develop branch. This is our main integration branch. So basically when pull requests get approved, they get, migra uh, they get merged into the develop branch. Um, so when we're deploying up to dev to Acquia, we check out this uh, the pipeline checks out that branch. It runs a grunt command to create a build artifact like I mentioned before, which is basically again just it's pulling in our custom code and then the code that's listed in our, our Drush make file. I'm just doing a little bit more than that. Like it's, it's also um, compiling like the SAS files for all of our themes into CSS, because we don't store the CSS files in development repository either, just the SAS source files. Um, next thing it does is it'll check out the Acquia Git repository. Um, so Acquia's deployments is all, all around Git. I think Pantheon works the same way. So you have an Acquia um, dev, test, and production environment and we have a branch for each of those in the Acquia repository. So basically in Acquia, the development, the development environment is tied to the development branch in Git, in Git. So that when we push code to the Acquia development branch, it automatically deploys up to the dev environment. So that's what this first step is. Right now it's manually triggered, so we're going into Bit, um, Bitbucket pipelines and like manually triggering this job. Um, this is a kind of a pointless slide, I guess, but it's just showing the three environments in Acquia. So right now, like, dev is tied to the development branch, stage is the stage, and prize is tied to the master branch. There's other ways to do deployment um, using tags, but we're not doing a tagging system because when we provision sites, 
uh, we need to modify code on production immediately because we need to update the sites.php file. So basically, our process for provisioning sites means that we have to update code. And because of that, it interferes with like a traditional deployment workflow where you're deploying the exact same code from here up to there. Um, it's very complicated to try to explain it further than that. I don't want to get too much into it, but just know that we're just using a branching model for the deployment so that we're just merging code from branch to branch. Um, this is what Bitbucket Pipelines looks like. Uh, so it's very similar to what Probo does. You're basically just, it's spinning up a Docker container and you're giving it a list of steps to execute. And here on the left, you can see our like, deployment workflow here. Um, so once we deploy to dev or test, we can run, click a button here, deploy, to deploy to the stage environment. And then when that's done, we can click another deploy to move it up to production. Um, deploying the test, pretty simple, just another pipeline job, and it just checks out the Acquia stage branch and merges the develop branch into it. Acquia cloud hooks will run, and basically that means when we're deploying code updates, we also need to check to see if any database updates need to run. Because with multi-site, as soon as you deploy the code, immediately all 280 websites are on that code but you still might need to manipulate the database in some way or clear caches for all of those sites, right? And because it's on shared hardware, you can't run that simultaneously for 280 websites because it'll just crash the server. Um, so we're running it sequentially. It can take hours at a time. So we're typically doing something like this in off hours or in the middle of the night. Um, this is another thing that Aqua Cloud Site Factory would, have so would solve for you, um, but we're not paying for that at the moment. Um, so, Next thing we'll do is we'll craft release notes based on what you know what has just been pushed up to stage. This is typically at the end of our three-week development cycle. So we create the release notes. We'll notify customers, include the release notes, like, hey, if you want to test out these new features we just added, check out your site on your QA environment. Here's a reminder on how to access your QA environment. Um, and we'll run a visual regression test on a few sites sometimes if the work that we've created, you know, significant changes and fix any found issues. So visual regression testing, this is a manual process that we're running right now um, against <coughs> our demo website. So demo.princeton.edu, which is like a demonstration of all the features of our Drupal 7 Temple platform. It's got like a ton of content in it. Um, so it basically is just the site is not meant to look pretty or anything, but it has like all the various different widgets and stuff that you can actually do on your site just to demonstrate all the features of it. But this is a really good site to QA, right? Because we can take screenshots using uh, backstop.js of all of the different um, pages on the site to make sure that the changes we just deployed up to QA, we wanna make sure that they look identical to what's on production right now or that the changes are expected, right? So I just did a simple test for this, which is uh, based on a different website, drupal.prince.edu, and I intentionally changed the font on the QA environment just to see what backstop.js would report. So I gave it two tests. One is like the desktop view, and down here is like a mobile view. And backstop.js is just controlling a headless browser that can take screenshots of any page you tell to visit. So first it creates a reference, which is um, basically goes towards production. And then the test goes against QA, and then it gives you a diff of the content. So if I click uh, the diff here, you'll see that the differences are highlighted in like a bright pink, so you can quickly see. And then it has this little scrubber bar too that you can go in and see the actual differences. So this is not an automated workflow that we're using for this because it's not reliable enough to do that. Sometimes I've noticed that it'll take a screenshot of a page and it'll just be completely blank, and I don't know why. So it's hard for us to like, put this into like our pull request, like testing workflow or anything. And again, we're also only testing like basically one website. It wouldn't be practical for us to do visual regression testing on like 250 websites, unless we maybe just limited it to the home page. But even then visiting 280 pages and like loading up, it would like, you need a big computer just to handle the memory that that, that would involve. Okay. So back to this. Um, so after all the QA is testing, we're pretty confident we're not gonna break anything. Uh, we push it up to production. So it's another pipeline job. It's very similar to the one for the moving QA. It just merges the staging branch into master and Acquia and deploys it. The, the um, cloud hooks run. 
we're using New Relic to monitor application performance. So New Relic, um, it's a paid service that you can log in and it's really helpful when you deploy new code and suddenly the response time for all of your pages is like 500 milliseconds higher, right? Well, you immediately know that something you deployed is slowing down all the sites. And New Relic has all of this um, tooling available to like introspect to the individual requests that are slow, figure out like what part of the process is actually slowing things down. It's like, you know, is the page requesting some external resource that is now down or something? So PHP is hanging up on that. Um, once we're confident there's no issues, we'll notify customers what happened and we'll have Website Wednesday, which is like a day or two later, um, basically talking about some of the changes that were made. Okay, that's Drupal 7 template. I know I'm talking really fast. I just want to get through everything. Uh, I'll have time at the end for questions. Um, our Drupal 7 custom platform. So this is for sites that are too complex to put in our template environment. Like they have custom functionality even if they just need a, sim a simple custom content type, we don't allow that in our template platform right now. So this immediately punts them to what we call a Drupal 7 custom site, okay? They're physically hosted as a multi-site in Acquia. That's mostly for cost reasons. Um, we're not get so we don't have an individual Docker for each of these sites. It's still hosted on multi-site. But because Drupal multi-site basically allows each multi-site to have like custom modules and themes, like this still works out. The problem is like now that all 40 of these sites are still sharing the same main Drupal core code base, so we can't update Drupal core individually for all, any of them, but that's okay. They're, we probably prefer it like this. Um, but so the sites can be completely distinct from one another. There's no like, there's not a whole lot of cohesion be between them. I think we do have some like shared code, like maybe the admin toolbar is the same on all the sites, but for the most part, it's like the Wild West. You can have you know, in Drupal, there's probably like five different ways to do layout management, and uh, we're probably using all five of them <laughs> for the custom sites. Um, so in Drupal 8, we're trying to fix all that, and I'll get into that. So if, because of this, obviously, it can be difficult to maintain, right? If uh, we get a support request, like one of our custom sites, this specific functionality isn't working, well, we don't know if that one developer um, who, like, created it you know, are they in today? Do they know, can they explain like why they did this that certain way? Um, so that's kind of a problem, the maintenance burden that custom sites represent. Um, the deployment process is pretty complicated for these to allow us because, well, so because we're hosting it all on one Acquia doc root, like on a multi-site doc root, it, Acquia has one Git repository for it, right? But we want to develop the sites independently of one another. So to accomplish that, we have separate Git development repositories for each of the 40 sites. And the contents of the repository are just the contents of the individual multi-site folder. So any of the custom modules and themes and the settings that PHP file just for that specific site are in the repository. And then we have a separate Git repository, which you see on the right there, the base distro. That just has like the drush make file in it that pulls in any um, like Drupal core itself, any patches for Drupal core. Um, any contrib modules that all of, that we know for sure, like all these sites are going to share, like the views module, for instance, those will be available on all the sites. And then we have another Bitbucket pipeline, which basically pulls them in together and creates a build artifact and pushes it up. So imagine a developer makes a commit to site D, right? They push that up to the develop branch that automatically triggers a Bitbucket pipeline to create this build artifact, which just pulls in the code from site D pulls in the base distro code, combines it, and like syncs it up to the Opera repo and pushes it up. Um, okay, I'm doing pretty good on time. So Drupal 8, uh, this is like a cool futuristic image, right? This is uh, the slides presentation I thought was getting pretty uh, like kind of boring, so I added this, but <laughs> this is what I searched for when I searched future, this is what came up. So Drupal 8 is our future in WDS. We're doing a lot of work to uh, you know, get ourselves ready for it. Um, we have a lot of goals for the platform based on all that we've learned from developing on Drupal 7 for like four years now. Um, we want to provide a lot more flexibility for content modeling. Um, well, let me back up a little bit. So I was saying that the Drupal 7 custom environment is a maintenance burden, right? And we have like 40 of those sites. We want to dramatically reduce the number of sites that we consider completely custom. 
Um, we really want the site that we're working on to truly be considered like a special site to be a custom site because of the maintenance burden. In the past, because our Drupal 7 Temple platform is so locked down, you can't even create custom content types. It pushes any site that has any like little special content modeling um, functional requirements into a custom site because you can't create custom content types in our Drupal 7 Temple platform. So to fix that, we're opening things up a bit. So we're gonna still have like this Drupal 8 Temple platform. We don't know what we're gonna really call it yet. We're still working on that. Um, but it's going to open things up so that WDS can create custom content types, custom taxonomy vocabularies, custom fields, and custom views for um, all the sites around the platform. So we think that that sort of thing, opening that up is not that big of a deal. Um, that's like bread and butter Drupal. Like Drupal is good at doing content data modeling, right? Like we should be able to have individual sites have their own content types and not be worried that it's going to create a maintenance burden. It really shouldn't. So we're going to open that up. Um, we're creating all the, these, most of the modules as optional. So right now when we provision a new Drupal 7 template site, you get like news, um, events, people, courses, even though you might not ever use any of it. So it doesn't present like a good user experience for um, editors when they go in to add new content and they see all these options that they know they're never going to use. So now when we provision a Drupal 8 site, you get basically just one content type called page and that's it. And that might actually satisfy the use case for like 20% of the sites we put on the platform. It's slightly faster because it's not loading a lot of code that it's never going to execute. And um, if you do need those other content types and other functionality, we created a separate administrative interface that our site administrators, the people that we're provisioning the sites for, like our individual department administrators, they can go in and they can enable those uh, modules that, that they, they want to use. So we've got a module for web form that's basically just a light wrapper around the, the web form contrib module. But then we've got a, um, a module for news, events, people, courses, so you can you know, enable those if you're gonna use them. So again, we wanna reduce the number of completely custom sites. A big focus on improving user experience, especially for the editors, right? So the experience of when you're going to create a page and you're entering content, we want that not to be a confusing. We'll strip away all the Drupalisms of everything um, and just you know, try to focus a lot on improving the user experience so that people have a positive um, experience with the platform. Um, we're doing a lot of automated testing, which we don't have uh, um, in our Drupal 7 sites at all. I'll get into that. Um, big focus on accessibility, too. Um, so accessibility has become a big deal at uh, Princeton recently. And most of our developers have become certified in an accessibility certification, um, which has been helpful because as we're working on the platform, we can, you know, do things from the ground up that we know are gonna be accessible. We don't have to introduce breaking changes down the road, like changing a div structure. Instead of outputting a giant list of divs for something, output it as like a UL, uh, an ordered list, which is more semantic. So screen readers can like quickly sort through that list rather than just like an unformatted div structure. So these are things that we're keeping in mind as we're designing the theme and the, the output. Um, clean documented code is important. We're doing, we have a pretty extensive code review process with our pull request to make sure that the code that we're introducing, you know, that we're following the same coding standard, where all the code is commented really well, because a lot of the stuff that we are doing in the platform, um, you know, there's like things that we're changing on forms and whatnot. And while a lot of the code itself is self-documenting, the intent is not. So it's very important that we describe like why we're making this change so that like six months or a year down the road, we can figure out like why something is behaving a certain way, what the intent was. I uh, love um, using Dev Desktop. Docker, I would say, is not like super ideal um, unless you're working in Linux. And the reason I say that is because the file system performance on Mac and Windows is like pretty abysmal. Um, you have to do like hacky workarounds, like use NFS. And uh, we're not using a Docker wrapper like Doxel, which is something that FFW had um, worked on, or Lando, which is another popular one. And the reason is I'm very hesitant, like I was mentioning before, to introduce anything that adds any uh, abstraction to the tooling. Because I, if something goes wrong, then like you're spending your time debugging that instead of working on the platform. Um, I did do a lot of experimentation with Drupal VM 
and Drupal VM is like its own big beast of software. Like it, it obviously makes things really easy to get started when you're just starting the project, but like Drupal VM is pumping out updates all the time too. So like when you pull, pull out an update, now you need a developer to read the release notes for all the updates you just brought in, figure out like if the update you're just applying is gonna break anything in your workflow. Um, so that becomes a problem. So we're just using like pure Docker Compose and no custom abstraction around it. Like there's just a few simple commands to spin up the Docker environment and like SSH into it. Um, common environment for everyone is like one of the big uh, perks of doing this. So we can be sure that everyone's using the exact same software in the development. And another big perk is that Bitbucket Pipelines allows you to specify a custom Docker image to, that you give it when it's executing like your build steps for deployment. So we give it the exact same Docker image that we use for local development. So when it's running our BHAT tests and stuff like that, we can run the exact same test in our computers and we should get the exact same output. So no silver bullet unless your whole like development team's on Linux, like then definitely Docker's amazing. Uh, automated testing. So from the beginning, we started doing this when we were working on this platform. We're using BHAT for the, the test suite. Um, very big wins for catching, catching regressions, right? Assuming the tests are written, um, written the right way so that you're actually testing like um, enough functionality that it would catch a regression. But what I really like about this type of test as compared to like a PHP unit test is this is like a real world test that you can do. BHAT works um, by basically, you're, you're telling it to control a headless browser and just capture the output of the page and make sure that whatever <coughs> you're telling BHAT should be on the page is actually on the page. So you can imagine um, a QA developer going in and manually doing all this stuff. Instead, you're just telling a computer to do it for you. So there's a lot of peace of mind in that. Um, we've already caught a lot of regressions in our development um, of it that we wouldn't have caught probably later, in, maybe until it was released to production. So this has been a big win. The cons, it's like slows down development quite a bit um, because writing the test suite is not trivial. Um, BHAT, and I'll show you, um, this is what like a, one of our BHAT tests looks like. So you describe with a scenario, it's written in like this language called Gherkin. Um, it's just kind of write out like a normal uh, sentence would be, but every sentence is special in that there's a regular expression that parses it to figure out like what code actually corresponds with each step. So this first one here, it says given I'm logged in as an admin, there's code that parses this line to figure out like, oh, I am logged in. This means I need to like visit the user login page and logged in as an admin means I need to create, quickly create a Drupal user account with the admin role and then log that user in. And there's literally, it's controlling Chrome for us. You don't have to use Chrome, but we're using Chrome. And Chrome is literally visiting the user login page, filling in admin as username and like a dummy password that I created for us and logging the user in. And you're telling it to visit a certain page. Um, this feature in particular is admins can define and use CK editor style. So when you're in CK editor, you have like a little style drop down to add like special classes to like a paragraph or something. Um, this is the feature that that's testing because we created a custom abstraction within our platform to allow our admins to define custom styles that would appear in that. So we're just making sure that in the future, like this is how it should work. If we deploy an update down the road, if we update Drupal core and like CK editor gets updated to a different version, that this will all still work. Um, they're very slow to run. Our test suite right now takes like 40 minutes to run in um, Bitbucket Pipeline. So uh, that's a downside, right? Especially if the test that breaks is at minute 39 <laughs> because you just like, you know, wait for all that time just to see that one test failure. Luckily what you can do is when you're working on a new feature, you can add like a special tag to the test and pass a command to only run that one specific test instead of running the whole test suite. Um, but yeah, as you add more and more tests, it takes a long time to run, especially if you're trying to do something where you're testing features on all the different user roles on your platform, right? So we've got the admin role, which is like the super administrator that just WDS staff have, has access to, but we also have site administrator and content manager, editor, um, I think author. So we want to test functionality for, for all those roles. And every time we want to write a test like that, we have to tell the browser to log out and log back in as that user, then visit this, log out, do it over and over again. So it takes a while. How do you run command line? Yeah, how do you run 
<coughs> so we're using Acquia BLT. Um, it's some sort of build launch tool, and it's kind of similar to what we were using Grunt for in Drupal 7. And um, I don't know really quite how to describe everything it does. It does a lot. Um, but what we use it primarily for is creating build artifacts, which is, again, like we don't store the actual code for Drupal core or the contrib modules, right? We just store metadata that references them. In Drupal 8, we're using Composer for that. So Acquia BLT will, when it's creating a build artifact, which is like the complete doc root of the whole site with all of your dependencies in it, the actual stuff that you would deploy up to Acquia, um, it's looking at that and it's like pulling in all of our dependencies for us. It's you know compiling SAS into CSS. Any custom commands we want to give it as well. Um, Aquia BLT is also used for rebuilding our local environment. So <coughs> our instructions for local development um, it's based around Docker. So you run like Docker compose up and you know pulls down the Docker image. And then once you're in, you like run. Um, you SSH into the Docker container, and then you run BLT Drupal install, right? And it will install like our default installation profile uh, for us, so BLT handles that. And it's also good for syncing remote data to local. Um, so if we're working in our local environment, typically we're working on a fresh installation of like just a single site, right? Um, but sometimes we want to test to see what happens with a live site. So like we're working on a feature that involves like a database update hook that needs to run. Um, we want to see what, what's going to happen on a site that already exists, so we'll pull down that database and we can use BLT for that too. It's like BLT Drupal sync, and um, it pulls, up, pulls down the database for you, um, runs database updates for you. BLT is really, it's, it's software that's maintained really well by Acquia, I recommend it. Um, eventually, like all the tooling with Drupal 8 gets kind of overwhelming, especially when you're transitioning from Drupal 7 where everything was just like Drush. But um, there is like a reason for all of it. it may, at the end of the day, it does make development a much um, nicer environment to work in. Um, we're using Bitbucket pipelines for the automated tests and the releasing. Um, this subtree split, I'm not going to talk too much about because um, I don't think I'll have time. Um, we're still refining the release cycle and the project management for this. We're using Jira instead of um, Bitbucket for the issue tracker. Bitbucket is primarily, it's like GitHub, right? So you can store uh, issues in, in it, but it's not really meant for like a full-fledged um, like agile workflow methodology. We, and, like the tagging system for like categorizing issues is very limited. And it's probably because Atlassian, who owns Bitbucket, also owns Jira, and they want you to use Jira because <laughs> you pay for it. So we started using it. Um, it's pretty big, complex software, but uh, it's really useful. Like it's got you know Kanban boards in it and advanced searching for issues and tagging and linking issues to one another. It integrates really well with Bitbucket pipelines. Um, so this is what pipelines looks like again. So when we're deploying to Dev or test, it's up there. Um, when we deploy to Sage and QA, we hit this deploy button, and this is what it looks like. So. Bitbucket is automatically extracting the issue numbers from our commits and linking the issue numbers directly to Jira. So we can see exactly what we're deploying to stage. Here's a list of all the issues that we actually put in that release. So that makes like crafting the release notes really easy. Um, and there's also that diff tab where it will give you the complete code diff of what's currently on that environment you're deploying to. So the integration between pipelines, Bitbucket, and Jira is like really tight. They're very happy with it. You can accomplish all the same stuff with other tooling too, though. Um, and yeah, so we're still refining the release cycle for the Drupal 8 platform. Um, you know, we're just getting to the point now where we're completing enough of like our MVP issues where we can like be safe enough where like, all right, we can put a site on the platform now. But um, you know, we're still heavily invested in our Drupal 7 platform too, and that's not going away anytime soon. But this is going to be the future where we're going to eventually start provisioning sites onto this platform instead. So I've got time left um, for any questions. Anyone wants to discuss anything further? I didn't get too deep into some of the technical stuff because um, I wasn't sure how, how interesting that would be. But um, yeah, otherwise we're done. Accessibility. accessibility? Yeah, accessibility is practice with the usual employee sites and also have to have tax on the Yeah, so in the sites database. 
So we've got the statistics. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So this is a, um, it's just a Drush command that runs on a site and it outputs JSON. So this is a custom code I wrote that just, you know, queries the Drupal database to get this information and it outputs it into JSON. And then the sites database just like invokes that command remotely, captures the output, and then stores it in the sites database database. And then here, you know, we, we normalize all the data so it can be presented and searchable. Yeah, so it runs the same command on each of our individual multi-sites. Yeah, sequentially. So it takes, you know, probably 30 minutes to run because we have like 280 sites on the platform now. Thanks. Can you be uh, migrating the Drupal 7 template sites to 8? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Um, one of the challenges is that the upgrade from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 is obviously not very straightforward. Um, it's not like a WordPress update. Um, like all the module maintain, like we may uh, rely on a lot of contributed modules in our Drupal 7 platform, right? And the, those modules may or may not exist in Drupal 8, or they may have been completely re-architected, right? So we're definitely, while we're building the Drupal 8 platform, we're not introducing dramatically different paradigms for how things are done. Like we're using Layout Builder for like building out the landing pages, which is similar to what we're using Panelizer for in Drupal 7. So we should technically be able to migrate the content over. The challenge would be the themes, because the, the markup is gonna be completely different now for all the themes. Best as we try to keep it in line, there's still gonna be pretty big differences. And because of a lot of our Drupal 7 sites have CSS injector, because um, a lot of departments at Princeton don't want a site that looks exactly like another department, and we can't develop like 280 themes. Um, we use CSS injector to you know, do the little customization as needed. You know, it's not, I, I highly doubt we're gonna be in a position where we can very easily just do a, a quick migration over to the platform. So I think probably what would end up happening is the sites will be on the Drupal 7 platform for a number of years, and then it would be, uh, we migrate the content over for sure, and then probably retheme it. Yeah, have CSS objection in Drupal 8? We did, yeah, yep. In your custom template site, when you testing, let's say you have two sites that are doing development, do you do the test thing across those sub site Because is that possible a conflict uh, between the two? Are you talking about, what, what kind of testing are you talking about? This stuff? No, no, you were showing that in the uh, custom temp, uh, template environment, right? Yeah, so when you eventually will combine them here, mm -hmm. so is that possible that, uh, you know, D and D can create some kind of conflict? Oh, okay. So, um, so the, these individual site repositories, yeah. they contain just the code that is in the specific multi-site folder for that site only. So they would never conflict with one another. But when updates are pushed out, only one job, only one deployment job can run at a time. So like they wouldn't both be racing to try to deploy at the same time. And yeah, the way that this works is the Aquia repository has all of the code in it already. And when a, a commit is made to one of these, we're just copying over what's changed into it. So we're not like erasing the existing sites folders that we're not touching. If site A was updated, we just copy over the new site A files into the Aquia repo and push it up. Can you talk a little bit more about the Aquia BLT? Aquia BLT? Yeah. Sure. Um, Aquia, they hopefully you can describe it better than I can. Yeah, so automation layer for testing, building, and launching Drupal 8 applications. So it's very much geared towards like the assumption that you're hosting your site on Aquia, although I think it probably could work without that assumption. Um, but it's, it, it's basically meant to, uh, <coughs> a very easy way to quickly get started and manage a Drupal 8 deployment cycle. So it's creating this build artifact for you, um, you know, compiling your SAS assets into CSS, running your composer install command. Sometimes all the stuff in your development repository, you don't necessarily want to deploy. So it has a procedure in place so you can give it a list of files that should not be copied over to Acquia for deployment, like your test files, you don't need up there. Um, what's your 
process for getting new developers set up? How long does that usually take? Uh, it could take a while, yeah. I mean, like, there's a lot of institutional knowledge around this, and we try to document as much <coughs> as we can. But um, all of the Bitbucket repos, and we have, like, we have um, an intranet, and we've got, like, a team Google Drive where we try to document as much as we can. But, you know, the, the base repository, for instance, has a readme file that describes all the steps on how to get started with local development. Um, but as you know, anything you document will be outdated like 10 days later, right? So it's not easy. But it's not like, we, it's not like we're getting new developers all the time either, you know? So. Can you speak up a little bit? Content changes in production. Um, so content, just content, uh, nothing is staged. So we have the QA environment in Acquia, but that's not used for staging content changes from staging to production. Everything happens in production. So if someone's adding new pages to the site, they just go in and they create the new page directly in the production environment. No, yeah. I think in an ideal world, we would have that capability where, in fact, the rocks and CMS that this is all replacing allows that, which is really nice. Um, you can basically stage all of your content changes in QA and then commit the content changes up. Um, but that's not, it's not as uh, trivial in Drupal. Um, we'd have to use, and I think it's getting there, like Drupal 8 with the workspaces module to be able to stage content, um, but we're not quite there yet. So, yeah, we basically tell everyone, that's why this, the QA environment gets out of date easily because you know, we only we don't automatically sync changes from production down to QA either. So that gets out of date and that's why they request that we sync it down so that they can test out the new features in that QA environment. But it's mostly just for testing configuration of theme and changes, not content. Yes, it's not that complicated. And one more question. You said that you have common accessibility issues. Can you describe what are your common accessibility issues on the sites? Um so accessibility one thing I will say is because um, one benefit of using WDS for building the sites is because we're like hosting everything on this one big uh, multi-site platform, any accessibility changes we make has a, they have a large impact, right? Because they immediately affect like 300 sites on campus. So, you know, we've contracted like with a firm that analyzed like our demo. In fact, I think the reason that we originally created demo.princeton.edu was so that we could do an accessibility audit of the platform. So it demonstrates all the capabilities of the platform so that someone who's testing for accessibility issues can quickly find them all, right? So um, color contrast is a big one. Um, so we try to, you know, all of our themes, make sure they're compliant in that regard. Um, a lot of stuff with, uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find one. Um, we have these like exposed, filters on some pages where like you can select from a drop down list, making sure that's keyword accessible is a big deal so that someone can actually navigate the page with just a keyboard and select input options on a form. Um, luckily, I, there were never like any huge ones. Let's see, we have an image slideshow somewhere, uh, image slideshow. So this is a big accessibility issue typically because there's a lot of interactive controls on it. So making sure that like these buttons are pressed, like you can press them just using a keyboard and not a pointer device. Um, you know, alt text on images. There's a lot of simple stuff that we that we knocked out pretty quickly, and it's still not perfect. We still have a big list of issues, but most of like the major blocking issues have been resolved. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, I mean, the demo that you was like if you search for it. The, the uh, that's a good point. We probably should. <laughs> uh, we're not. Yeah, I guess we're not. I mean, there's no harm in it. I mean, it's not like we want to hide this site because we point people to this all the time when we're demonstrating like what the platform's capable of, right? But yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Probably you don't want this to show up in a random search for Princeton. Yeah. It's a fake site. It's a fake site, essentially, yeah. In fact, we originally had, um, we, we were using like real university figures and like the people content type, and then we thought like we might offend people. <laughs> so we instead just put like dead presidents in, because like they can't be offended, I guess, I don't know. 
So like our people content type, like we used to use like university professors and stuff, and we changed that because like we just don't want to deal with that. Yeah. So Git, um, that's a feature of Git actually. So you can provide Git um, like a bash command to run when a commit is being executed and it'll fail that commit, it'll prevent you from making the commit unless the bash script you provide it passes with like an exit code of zero. So if you try to do a commit and you don't put the issue number in it, it'll give you an error explaining that you have to add it. Right, commit hooks? Commit hooks, that's what they're called, yeah. Git commit hooks. All right, so we're out of time, but if anyone has any more questions, you can just come grab me. Thank you.